children growing up are much like the pets in my household. There's two dogs and a cat. They don't have, they're not really responsible for much of anything. Uh, unofficially, they're re responsible for security. They let us know what's going on, you know. The dogs and the cat, useless in that regard, but. Uh, <laughs> cats, dogs have masters, cats have staff, you know, so. Uh, <laughs> So we're staff to keep him happy. If we keep him happy, he's, he's good, you know. But, but uh, for the most part, they, you know, they, even in the Word it says that the animals in nature that they look to God to supply them their food in in proper time, you know. So they aren't, aren't responsible for much, but they, on the other hand, are dependent, and so uh, they don't have a lot of freedom either in that regard. We, however, were created as part of a different order within God's creation. We have responsibilities and freedom to go with being not just human, but being God's representatives on the earth, being created in his image, and being given dominion over the earth. And it's a much broader subject than we're covering today, but as believers, uh, we're people who are born again, who've been redeemed, given a new life in Christ. Uh, my life as a believer in Jesus consists primarily not in enjoying the benefits of my salvation. I get to do that, but in terms of uh, working out my salvation in terms of the what it, because I'm a saved person saved from the, the future that I could have had to get the future that I don't deserve but I'm going to get how, how does that change me what kind of person do I become and so I become a person who is um, Paul said in Galatians 2 20 it is no longer I that lives but it is Christ Jesus that lives in me and the life I live I live by faith so my life is about service and responsibilities before the Lord and, and the other people that he put in my path to serve. Now I get many things from the Lord and we minister to one another so we receive things from other people too. By the way, if you approach most of your, not most, all of your relationships that way, you will be a fun person to be around. A lot of people like to be around those kind of people. If, on the other hand, uh, you would never do this, but if you're around people that are only, are always forever, you know, looking at people for what can you do for me um, even service-minded people get tired of that you know eventually uh, so that's just a FYI on relationships if you want to be make good friends that's one of the ways to do it well, so, so let's read uh, chapter 9 verse 1 and we'll read the, just the first couple of verses but let's pray first Heavenly Father I Thank you for your strengthening of all the saints here today. Thank you that even though we may be tired physically, that we are alive in the spirit because of your spirit living in us and we're excited about what you're doing in our lives and in the lives of those who are around us. So we pray that you would continue to bring to completion the good work that you started in us. And not only in us, but in our community as well. That you would enable us to enlarge our capacity and ability to impact people for eternity in St. Louis, in Jesus' name. Okay, chapter 9, verse 1 says, Am I not free? The Apostle Paul speaking to the Corinth, Church of Corinth. Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not the result of my work in the Lord? Even though I may, be an apostle, may not be an apostle to others, surely I am to you. For you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. Now, the previous chapter, he was talking about uh, meat sacrifice to idols and how people shouldn't be using their freedom. They can eat that kind of meat. It's already been sacrificed. Now it's being sold, you know, at the farmer's market, so to speak. And you should buy it, eat it without question. But if you're around people who are still so accustomed to idols that they feel like they're sitting when they eat that meat, then be sensitive to their conscience so that you don't wound their conscience by causing them to do things that they think are wrong. So that was the previous chapter. So now he's using himself as an example. He says, I'm an apostle, am I not? I've seen the Lord. He had his vision on the road to Damascus. Remember he was on, uh, I don't remember if he was on foot or horseback. I have to go look at the text, but uh, he was with some companions. And uh, the Lord appeared to him in a bright light and spoke to him. His companions didn't see the light, but they heard the sound. They were terrified. And uh, 
As a result, he became a believer instead of one who persecuted the church. And so then he uh, began his ministry. He received his calling at that time, too, though I'm sure the Lord clarified that in subsequent experiences with the Lord. Paul had a number of those in his life. But uh, so he had seen the Lord, even though he wasn't one of the 12 or the 120 or the 500 that followed him in his ministry on earth when he was still walking down the earth. And it was called to apostleship. And he said, even if I'm not an apostle to others, just because somebody's an apostle doesn't mean everybody even in the church recognizes it. Uh, there's something about the ministry of the apostle that sometimes there's controversy involved and people don't always accept them as who they're called to, especially if they're walking in humility. And so they said, even if I'm not apostles to other, an apostle to others, I am to you. And he's establishing his seal of apostleship. It's based on calling, it's based on having seen the Lord, but in this case it's also certified by them. They are the seal of his apostleship in the Lord. In other words, he went preached the gospel to them, established the church, and, uh, and, and so it is. So now here he is talk, writing a follow-up letter to them. So, uh, verses 3 through 6, he presents a human, just a human observation, human point of view. This is my defense to those who sit in judgment on me. Verse 3. Don't we have the right to food and drink? And don't we have the right to take a, a believing wife along with us, as do the other apostles and the Lord's brother and Cephas? Cephas, of course, was Peter's name before the Lord gave him a new name. Or is it only I and Barnabas who must work for a living? Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its grapes? Who tends a flock and does not drink of the milk? Verse 4, he says, We have a right to food and drink, don't we? Now, notice he didn't say we have a right to 5,000 square foot home, a Learjet, drive a Learjet, you know. Uh, he did say and we have a right to a limousine, you know, or a Mercedes Benz. Of course, they didn't have any of those things, but they had riches back then. But he was not talking about that. Uh, he said, we uh, can be assured the Lord will provide us food and clothing. We contend with that. Uh, you know, in our culture, it gets cold at night. It's really cold in the winter. We expect, we trust the Lord to provide housing as well. But it didn't necessarily promise us that we're going to have the lifestyles of the rich and famous. Now, some of us, the Lord does bless in that way, and we have that kind of income. Doesn't mean we have to use it on those kinds of things. But uh, the promise is for, you know, basic. The abundance is for the, the work the Lord has called me to do. The, the sufficiency is for my own need. And so, he says, we're entitled to that. And uh, he says, uh, verse 5, we have the right to bring a believing wife along with us. From that you can gather that both Paul and Barnabas are single. They're out doing the ministry. They're a traveling ministry team together. And what he's acknowledging here is that some of the other apostles had wives. We know Peter had one because he had a mother-in-law. Yeah. Mother-in-law, they got healed. They were meeting at her house. She served him food after she got healed. So he had a wife, and uh, so several of the ministers, even the apostolic brothers, traveled with their wives in company with them, or in some cases maybe their family stayed home once in a while when they were on a traveling ministry trip. Well, you know, when you do ministry, and when you especially traveling ministry, and you do it as a married person, it changes some things, doesn't it? You know, there's a little bit, um, you can make personal sacrifices as an individual that might not be appropriate, you know, when you have a spouse to look after. You know, so that changes things a bit. So, uh, he said, we have the right to do this, but we don't do that. Um, Paul and Barnabas are, are single, bringing an extra wife along, requires different types of provision. I want to make sure that she has enough food, but to make sure that you know, take care of all of her needs as, you know, whatever it is that is needed along the way. So, when he says, uh, you know, are we the only ones that have to work for a living? Now, if you're not teaching your kids at, at, when they're young, you want to teach them the fact that everybody works. Everybody works. Uh, you know, dad in a traditional family, dad worked, but mom and most times it's two income families today to make ends meet. But even with a a homemaker, mom works harder at home. You know, raising kids and taking care of the house, and dad does, actually does. You know, that's why he comes home and helps out as well. Kids go to school. It's not a 40-hour-a-week job, but they 
we expect them to do that. Kids used to do a lot more work than they, used, than they do today, but we're training them to take their place in society as a productive member, and, and everybody works. But you know, in this sense, what he's talking about is that working by vocation, working with his hands, Paul was a tent maker. And so he worked during the daytime, he preached the gospel on the side. He had a day job to support his ministry habit. And uh, so he was, uh, both he and Barnabas were bivocational ministers, but that wasn't necessarily the rule, especially among the apostles. Most of them did this on a full-time basis. And he's saying, um, we are just as entitled to this as the other apostolic brothers. He said, that's not the point. He said, who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its grapes? And who tends a flock and does not drink of the milk? So he uses some human examples. So then uh, verse uh, 7, uh, we read verse 7? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, verse 8 says, do I, mere, do I say this merely on human authority? Doesn't the law say the same thing? For it is written in the law of Moses, do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain. Is it oxen about, is it about oxen that God is concerned? Surely he says this for us, doesn't he? Yes, this was written for us because whoever plants and threshes, threshes should be able to do so in the hope of sharing in the harvest. If we have sown spiritual seed among you, is it too much if we reap a material harvest from you? If others have this right of support from you, shouldn't we have it all the more? So the law, Old Testament law, Moses, writing uh, from Mount Sinai, he said, the law says that they were... They use an ox to tread out corn that they were not supposed to muzzle it so it can't eat the corn that it's treading out. So that wouldn't be fair to the animal. He says God wasn't really that concerned about the ox. He was really putting it in there as a principle of illustration for us. He said that's mostly written for us. And so whoever plows and threshes should be able to share in the harvest. When I was in 10th grade, I was in choir and they recruited us as volunteers for the Magical Singers Dinner. They had a magical team of singers that would do kind of a medieval or, or um, you know, type of dinner. So they all dressed up in the clothing. It was kind of fun. We dressed up as servants would in those days. And then people paid money, they wrote checks and ordered tickets, and they got this big six-course meal. But all of us at our high school students were there during our dinner hour, We'd come home, and then go to, you know, serve. I found out when we got there, they don't feed you. Oh, wow. So we're feeding a six course meal, seven with steak and everything. They didn't have anything for us. We were not allowed to eat anything either. Like, the, I wasn't a believer then, but I knew there's something not quite right about this picture here, you know. Uh, so the ox is, uh, you know, is, is, is an illustration of how those who uh, thresh and those who plow, you know, sowing and all that, everybody reaps in the harvest, not just the person who you know, brings the stuff in at the end. So he said, if we've sown spiritual seed among you, is it too much to reap material harvest from them? Now, you're going to find out in a minute, he's not telling them this because he wants them to write him a check. That's not why he's telling them this. He's using this as a, to make a point here. He says, if others have this right of support, don't we all the more? So then when I look in verse 13, he says, but we did not use this right. On the contrary, we put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. Don't you know that those who serve in the temple, he's using an Old Testament illustration again, get their food from the temple and that those who serve at the altar share in what is offered on the altar. All the Levites were priests, but then there were some from the house of Aaron, they were specifically the priests who actually ministered at the altar. And uh, they got food from what was part of what was to lose. Uh, sacrifice on the altar was made available for them to eat as well. In the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. Now, a couple centuries removed, uh, two millennia actually, and uh, we, we, we know, we understand this. I mean, there's 300,000 churches across America. We have pastors, many, a great deal of whom are receiving their support along those, those lines as well. But uh, he says those who serve at the temple get their food there, those who serve at the altar do so as well. And he's commanded that those who preach the gospel get their living from it. And he said, but we didn't use that right. He said, we would prefer not to hinder the gospel of Christ. So we would rather come in and do it free of charge. And so then 
Yeah, we undercut any kind of arguments that we're doing this for money, for one thing. And then secondly, uh, it just makes it easier for us to go about doing that. Verse 15, he says, But I have not used any of these rights, and I'm not writing this in any hope that you will do such things for me. For when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast, since I am compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. If I preach voluntarily, I have a reward. If not voluntarily, I am simply discharging the trust committed to me. What then is my reward? Just this, that in preaching the gospel, I may offer it free of charge, and so not make full use of my rights as a preacher of the gospel. So what he's saying is that him preaching the gospel is like him turning his assignment in the school. Um, he's just doing what's been assigned. Uh, him preaching at free of charge is his extra credit. He's looking for extra credit work here. So that's, he's earning some extra credit. So I'm not using these rights and I'm not writing this so that you will change that for me. Now if you study the Apostle Paul's ministry throughout his lifespan as it's recorded in scripture, you find out he did receive support from people on occasion. Um, uh, and more so as he got later in life. But at this point in his life, he was not doing that. And when he received help, it would be like this. He'd go to the Corinthian church, spend time there, preach the gospel to them, free of charge, they would get saved, build a church, and then he'd go to the next city. Now they're in a relationship with him. Many times they would send him some support as believers to the next church he was going to, the next city, so that he could plant another church there. So that did happen along the way eventually. But at this point that wasn't happening. It certainly never happened with the, Corinth, the church of Corinth while he was there. He spent a whole year there and didn't get support from them. So he said, I did not use any of these rights. I'm not writing so that you do so. He said, when I preach, I'm compelled by obligation. I have a job to do. I'm doing my job. But he said, in fact, if I don't do my job, I'm in big trouble. Woe to me if I don't preach the gospel. So he said, I'm just simply discharging the trust committed to me. So he said, I don't make my full use of my rights as preacher because I'm wanting to earn, you know, a little bit of extra credit here. Verse 19, he says, though I am free, I belong to no one. I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law but am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people so that all, by all possible means I might save some. I do this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. So it's the first of all I make myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. So um, this isn't a preacher like sometimes you see in contemporary American culture today that uh, they do ministry for the sake of receiving things from people. You know, this is a guy who's doing ministry to give to people what they need. And so to the Jews, he said, to come like one of the Jews. Now, of course, he was born a Jewish man, and he was actually a Pharisee under the, the, uh, the teacher Gamaliel. Um, uh, Gamaliel? I'm not sure if I remember saying that right. Uh, so he was well-versed in this, but now as a New Testament believer in Jesus, now that he's in turn in, encountered in relationship to living God, and uh, the Messiah. Uh, he's not under the law anymore, speaking of the Old Testament law of Moses. He said, but when I'm hanging around with Jewish people, I want to win Jewish people to the Lord, so I act like a person who's still living under the law. I follow the rules of the law so I, I can reach them. He's being culturally sensitive. We live in a multicultural place in St. Louis, even more so, uh, in the last year or two in our immediate area here. As much as possible, we want to try to be sensitive to what, where people are at in their culture so that we can reach them, become among them, get among them, and, and get to know them, and so reach them, whoever they are. So, so I become like those who are, I'm not under the law, I become like those who are under the law to win those who still are in that place. But to those who are not under the law, I become like one not having the law. Now he, he clarifies this. He says, I'm not free from God's law. I'm free from Christ's law. So, I should have got out of, I thought about getting out of chalkboard today. Uh, you can picture an umbrella that has God's law, and then over here on one side is the law of Moses, and then over here is the law of Christ. 
the two are in agreement with each other. Jesus said, love your neighbor with your, you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, love your neighbor as yourself. All of Moses' law hangs on those two. So they're in agreement with each other. But Moses' law had a different purpose and it was fulfilled in Christ. So now, those who are in Christ are not under Moses' law anymore. They've been, uh, we've been conveyed over to a new covenant with different promises Amen. and different different uh, requirements. So there's a lot of agreement between the two, a lot of overlap. But he said, we're not under Moses' law anymore. We're under, we're still under God's law, but it's under a new mediator through Jesus Christ. However, he said, so when I'm hanging out with the Gentiles, I don't have to worry about trying to be Jewish to them. It's okay to walk in the freedom that we have in Christ so long as I'm still under God's law, operating under Christ's law. And I can become more accessible to them than if I were to become, be uh, walking strictly in the, you know, the requirements of the Jewish faith <clears throat> and making it appear to them that they now have to become Jewish in order to know the Lord. And they don't have to do that anymore. So I, he said, I'm not going to do that for them. So I said, to the weak I become like one, the weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people that I might save some. I do this for the sake of the gospel. So I remember to go back to the previous chapter. He's talking about eating meat sacrificed to idols. Who would that primarily be concerned about? Well, depending on the person, it could be a Gentile that used to be an idol, or it could be a Jewish person that's you know really sensitive to the requirements of the law and, and so forth. But uh, he wanted to be sensitive to where they're at and not to use his own freedom to eat meat. Uh, he's not going to order a steak if it's going to cause a problem for somebody. You know. So I, I do this all. Verse 23, to share in the gospel's blessings. When he's talking about the gospel's blessings here, he's not talking about the blessings that you so often hear about if you turn on the television and listen to mm -hmm. preachers today. Um, I, we have promises for material blessing in the Lord. What he's talking about here is the kind of blessings that he can get while living a sacrificial lifestyle, working for a living, preaching on the side, not getting anything for preaching the gospel. He's getting the gospel blessing because he's sharing with the Lord in the winning of souls. Those who sow and those who reap share in the blessings together. And so in eternity, he's investing in eternity by investing in people's lives. He said, I'm going to get a payout on that someday. You know, I'm going to get blessings from the Lord. That's the blessings that he's after. He's not after material blessings which pass away. So, verse 24, he gives an, an illustration from the Olympics. You know, they, what year did they start up again in the 20th century? 1912? Something like that? I don't remember. I have to look at the history. By the way, a good movie on that touches on that uh, uh, about Louis uh, Zamperini. Uh, what's it called? Unbroken. Unbroken, thank you. Yeah, we saw it at the theater. Uh, very good movie. He was an uh, Olympic athlete. He was going to compete in World War II, but of course, they were canceled because it was held and going to be held in Germany at the time. So he ended up in a POW instead. Uh, but uh, the Olympics started in the 20th century, but they had Olympics in the first century. That's where we got the whole idea from. So they used to do this back in the Grecian Empire times. And uh, Paul, if he wasn't a sports fan, he was at least consciously aware of it because he uses it several times in his letters as illustration. Verse 24, he says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize. Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last. But we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore I do not run like someone running aimlessly, and I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. I, I might show it next week. I didn't want to take the time to look it up, but uh, I found a clip from Monty Python and the Holy Grail where they got these priests going along chanting and they're hitting themselves with a board. It was a medieval practice, not quite like that. I was making fun of it. There was a me medieval practice where they were uh, called flagellation where the monks would, would you know, it's like pain on their bodies as a means of trying to attain spirituality. It was really not grounded in grace and the gospel. But, you know, they were really dedicated, wanting to try and prove something, I guess. 
But that's not what he's talking about here when he talks about beating his body. So let's go back to verse 24. He says, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize. Now, generally, when you're talking about the race we're running, it's more appropriate to look at a marathon than a sprint. So we're in, a, we're in it for the long haul. But uh, she said, run in such a way as to get the prize. Now, the good news about the race you're running is that... Um, you're the only one on it. It's a, it's a pass or fail. To, if you finish, you win. Um, so it's not like all of us are competing against each other and one's going to get the prize here. Um, we're competing against the world, the flesh, and the devil. Those are obstacles and so forth. But all of us have a, a course marked out for us. It says in Hebrews, it says chapter 12, let us uh, lay aside sin in every weight that entangles and run with perseverance the course that is marked out before us. So... Our, we all have a course or race to run. But he said in verse 25, everyone who competes in the game goes into strict training. When you're running such a way as to win the prize, uh, there's a certain amount of training involved too beforehand. Now the training is ongoing for us in our life race. It's not like we spend the first 30 years in training and then we enter the race. Uh, the training begins the moment that you become a believer. And you're in training, but then you're also running the race, you know, it's a picture of running the race 9 to 5, and then going doing some training after hours, you know, if you would. But uh, we're running a race, and uh, people go into strict training. Uh, for example, the female athletes at the Olympic level, uh, they train at such a level that uh, they stop menstruating while they're in training. So I made the joke before, if you don't like that part of, your anatomy, you know, going to strict training, you can avoid that, you know. It's a joke, really, but it does happen. Uh, the, the level of training that Olympic athletes go into is huge uh, in order to accomplish the things that they do. They don't just have natural ability. Uh, if we can use the athletics or you could use music training or whatever, uh, uh, great chess player, people don't become great at those things by simply having ability. In fact, in the long run, for the greatest people, ability is highly overrated. Um, it's actually it's about 5% inspiration, about 95% perspiration. It's the hard work that goes into uh, uh, doing all that stuff. Uh, one of my favorites right now in NBA, and I'm not really following basketball, but I do try to pay attention once in a while, a guy named Stephen Curry. He's a believer in Jesus, by the way. Uh, but He's amazing to watch because he's full of home police, smokes, awesome moments all the time when he's playing basketball. In the playoffs just recently, he made a 62-foot shot at the buzzer. So, and he's so good that when he takes a shot, many times he turns around and walks and walks away. He starts heading for the other side. He already knows it's going in. He's, he's that good. He's fun to watch. You know? I like this. Um, I was watching a video where he was, somebody was throwing some highlights and he does it behind them the back pass to another player and he goes up. He says he has no regard for your defense in America. No regard. Yeah. <laughs> See, he's that good. But the way he got that way was not simply from ability. He's got some natural ability. It's from years and years and years of hard practice, you know, to become that good. Whether it's a Tiger, Tiger Woods or Michael Jordan or, uh, you know, one of the football players, they get good by practice. So, he's using this as an illustration, but he says, Run in such a way as to win the contest, you know. Um, in another passage, he said that those who, he's writing to Timothy, he said that those who compete into the, in the games, they don't win unless they follow the rules. You know, they have, if you break the rules, you get disqualified from the games, right? Um, in baseball, if they don't run around the bases and, and hit them at least, they're not going to get a home run when they cross home plate, right? So they've got to do all that. So uh, everyone competes in the games, to, goes into strict training, and do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. I photographed an Asian family Tuesday night, and then on Saturday morning, Friday night, uh, I, I was here, Thursday night, I was over there. And uh, some of the girls were waiting for the grandparents to get uh, photographed, and then the, parent, the mom came in with the youngest child, Really little, they had a gymnast suit on, and they had a little, little gold medal, like an Olympic medal, hanging on her chest. I said, "You must have won it! Congratulations, you won an Olympic medal. You won a gold medal." Um, 
They do that, but in order to, to get those things, you have to not only train to compete, but then also you have to be competing according to the rules as well. But our crown is going to last forever. Paul is thinking about an eternal crown. He's not thinking about temporal things when he does his ministry. So he said, for that reason, I strike blows to my body and make it a slave, so that after I preach to others, I might not be disqualified for the prize. His greatest fear is that after leading millions or thousands or hundreds of thousands of people to the Lord, that he could end up missing heaven. If you understand the full scope of this picture, it's possible. Uh, there are people that are going to stand before him, according to Matthew 7, and he's going to say, Depart from me, workers of iniquity, I never knew you. And there'll be signs and wonders people, casting out demons, healing the sick, raising the dead kind of people that are in that line. So uh, none of us are exempt from the possibility of that occurring. However, None of us ever, you know, none of us need necessarily go in that direction. But he said, so I want to be careful that I'm watching over myself in, this, in the process there. So, beating, striking a blow to his body is not, you know, cutting himself, hitting himself, or anything physically like that. Um, what he's talking about is, you uh, beat your body into submission. You did so this morning if you got up and you didn't feel like it. Amen, everybody, right? I'm going, I don't care how, if my back hurts or I'm tired or whatever, my feet hurt, I'm going. That's it, I'm just going to do it. Picture Paul, yeah. Picture Paul in his life, he's making tents all day, and then he'd preach at night, maybe stay up till 2 in the morning, get up at 6 and make tents again. In the morning, his body's saying, no, please do not make me do this again. I want to sleep. So he's making his body his slave. In other words, he's exercising self-discipline is what it is. Um, and athletes understand this. I understand this from exercise, but also um, I learned it first by being on a sports team. To, how many have ever been on a sports team before? Okay. For those who have, have, when you start going, especially a team where you have to practice every day, the coaches make you do things that you don't feel like doing. They say, if you don't like it, you can leave the team. Well, I showed up because I want to be on the team, so I don't want to leave the team, so I'm going to do it. But my body say, no, I don't want to run any more laps, you know. And, but they make you do it. Now, and so after you've been in it for a few weeks, you start to realize you can make yourself do things that you didn't think you could do. You didn't know, you, you didn't even think you wanted to do. You can make yourself do stuff you didn't want to do just because you know it's important. That's, that's self-discipline. Well, this is, he's talking about this from a kingdom standpoint. Uh, his service and ministry to the Lord is along those lines. So run the race that's marked out for you Hebrews 12, 2. Make sure that you make it to the finish line. Endurance is needed. And then compete according to the rules, 2 Timothy 2, 5. And the competition is not to beat out other believers. The competition is to beat the world, the flesh, and the devil. Our own flesh and our own sinfulness. So everybody goes into the into uh, our spiritual Olympics, if you will. Goes into strict training. They do it to get an eternal crown, not a temporal crown. And the way, if you use Paul's life as an example, he says, I don't run aimlessly. Um, if you want to get to the finish line ahead of other players, you don't waste any steps, right? You take the shortest possible route. Um, in fact, I used to run hurdles. And when you run hurdles, uh, you try to figure out how many steps you need between hurdles. I was running the 110 hurdles, and I was had a problem because my legs were a little too short to run seven steps. I did it a few times, but it... Um, I slowed down my time, but when I ran nine steps, it was, uh, you know, two minutes. I probably need to do eight steps and alternate every other leg, use both legs to go over the hurdles. But, but you can figure these things out. Uh, you don't run aimlessly. You're going to run with a purpose in mind. And now this is, never mind the sports now for a minute. In your own spiritual walk, you just, only you can answer this question, but you need to be asking this to yourself. Am I running with purpose and direction or am I running aimlessly? When I get up in life, in, you know, in the morning, apart from whatever, you know, responsibilities I have as far as, you know, earning an income and pay for the bills, uh, am I walking with purpose and direction or am I just kind of hanging out in life? Um, if I'm just hanging out all the time, if the moment I get off work, you know, it's downtime, from that point on, I'm just basically, you know, existing. I'm in need of a little bit more purpose and direction in my life because God has a lot more in store for me than that. 
So when I get that purpose, and that requires me to run with vision, but also with perseverance and with self-discipline, he says, when I fight, I don't air box or shadow box. I'm not punching at the air. Um, of course, uh, I, using only my musical background, I like to use the illustration of air guitars. Have you seen air guitars? You know? Yeah, air guitar is fun. But the thing is, it's easy. You don't ever actually have to learn how to play guitar to do it. You know, if you play the music loud, you can feel like you're actually doing it. You know. Uh, but he says, I'm not an air guitarist. I actually have learned my instrument. Uh, I beat my body, make it my slave, and make it do things it doesn't feel like doing. And uh, so then he said, after I've preached to others, I can be sure that the Lord will be pleased with me because I'm doing the things he's called me to do. All right, so conclusion, do everything for the sake of the gospel in your life. Uh, for the, and when we talk about the gospel, we live in a culture where there's a gospel culture, or gospel music, right? Mm -hmm. So it loses some of its meaning. The gospel was, the, the Greek word was for the, the message or the good news. The message itself that God created when he wrote, raised Jesus from the dead, sent him on the cross and raised him from the dead, that message has power on it because the Holy Spirit gets behind it when it's preached. You know, and it can be preached in a lot of different ways. It's communicated. Preaching is communicating. It's not necessarily doing what I'm... I'm not preaching here. I'm teaching. But it's not necessarily standing before a group of people. You know, you can preach one-on-one -on -one simply by sharing your faith with people. But uh, do everything for the sake of the gospel in your own personal life. And the sake of the gospel is much more comprehensive than evangelism. If you're doing everything for the sake of the gospel when you bring donuts for people at church on Sunday, or make the coffee, or vacuum the floor, you know, all those things that we do, uh, you know, the people that made food and the people that served yesterday at our outreach, that was everything for the sake of the gospel. Um, most people that were here yesterday could have done something else with their Saturday, you know. And especially those of you who work full time jobs, it's one of your days off. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of other things you could have been doing, but you were here. And that was for the sake of the gospel. That's what we're talking about. And uh, become all things to all people so as to win some of them, if possible. So, finding out where people are at, what is it going to take? You know, where's the open door to reach them for the Lord? You'd be looking for that. And find out what it is that you can do. This is a principle, you know, this is a principle. Of, um, we can't tell you the specifics because we're not dealing with the particular individual. I want to learn how to minister to Hindus. I've never had the opportunity before. So I want to find out what it takes to reach Hindus. We had a couple young guys that came yesterday. Well, one young guy and one not as young guy whose daughter, the young guy, is going to be married. And uh, they're believers, but they're, they're Nepali people. And so uh, he, we're going to have let him use the building and do his wedding here. He needs a place to get married. This is, a young, this is a young preacher of the gospel, this kid. He's not just a believer. He's a, he's a cold minister. Um, young guy. Very sharp. But uh, he's going to school me a little bit. I'm going to talk to him. Because he, he, he grew up in a Christian home, but he understands the Hindu culture from the inside out. So I want to find out. I want to know how to reach Hindu people. Hindu people. All right, so become all things to all people, and then run and get the prize. You have a... God has a high calling in you, in God, in Christ. It's a high call in God for you that he's given to you as a believer. Everybody's calling is a little different, but it all shares similar characteristics. And uh, you can be great in God when you stand before him in eternity, regardless of whether people on earth really ever noticed you. Because it's not really about that. Not everybody is called to have a ministry like Billy Graham or... You know, Reiner Bonke, but everybody is called to uh, the ministry of the believers, the ministry of the saints. And uh, your reward can be just as great or greater than one of those highly visible figures because who much is given, much is required. You know, So you will only be responsible for what the Lord has called you to do. That's good news because uh, uh, I have a hard enough time just with that. How about you? But with His grace, it's sufficient for you to do all things in Him so you can do that. We can do this thing. Question? It's not a question of the same. Come. Since you brought up Hindus, I have been working very hard, and not in my own power, but with the Lord, trying to win people to the Lord. Yes, you have. But I have, I feel like I've been talking to people of Hindu persuasion that don't understand my language. 
No, you feel like that sometimes. Yes. Yeah. And it, it's like, boom, right over their head. That's a good point. And I've changed my talk. I've did it differently. I've come at it different ways. And mm -hmm. That's excellent. You know, what she's saying is that, you coming up, Brenda? Oh. Uh, what she's saying is that she's realizing that the people in our culture today, they're about as foreign to the Christian faith as the Hindu people are. Right. And that's the truth. It's because they're coming from a completely different worldview. 50 years ago, it wasn't that way in America. But the, the culture has shifted and it has a different worldview, a different religion, the humanistic religion, which works good with some things and not with others. Um, you know, we'll get into that sometime. But uh, that's part of, if you want to really find out how to become all things to all people, how do we get inside the mind of this uh, agnostic generation that we live in and reach, speak to them in their language, help them understand? I'm, gonna, I'm a student of that myself and I want to help you with all that too. Yeah. Well, um, I prayer. I think the covering things and pr praying, you know, being prayerful and asking the Lord for wisdom mm -hmm. on each individual person and you know, just being led by the Holy Spirit and our timing of speaking about the Lord. I think people are, need a relationship with us and um, we, if we build relationships, then we um, build a trust of, you know, be, we earn the right to speak into their lives, but it comes from relationships and just loving people yep. because um, it's by the love of God shown and expressed through our deeds and our actions that they can see that we um, have relationship that they would want. So I just, uh, I'll just, let's just pray on that today. Let's end in prayer about that. We are, we are called and we are the light of the world because Jesus lives in us. So Heavenly Father, we come before your throne of, of grace this morning. We just praise you, God, for all that you've done in our lives. We just give you thanks this morning as a corporate God for being such a wonderful friend, a wonderful leader, for being such a great shepherd. We thank you for your friendship, Lord, how you give us all we need, Lord. And we cry out to you this morning for wisdom from above and for the anointing of the Holy Spirit for the abundance of love that we find in you. We just yeah. we just thank you for these things. We say we have all we need in you, Lord. It's all about you and your presence, God. So we thank you that as we leave here this morning, Lord, that your presence goes with us, Lord, that, that your power goes with us, Lord, that your words go with us, Lord. And, yeah. and Lord, we thank you that you will help us to love those. And we thank you that you'll show us, Lord, wonderful ways to express your love to them. Lord, we ask for you to go before us, Holy Spirit. Prepare hearts to hear your word. Prepare uh, eyes to see, Lord. We just pray, Lord, you would take the blinders off the those that we're going to speak to this week. And, and I just pray for our actions each day, Lord, to line up with who you are inside, Lord. Help us to be ever mindful that you are um, in us and, and wanting to live live and, and live love through us. Holy Spirit, we just thank you for the anointing. We just lift up our hands this morning, and we just receive that anointing, Lord. We just thank you for helping us abide in your love this week. We thank you that you're a shield around about us this week, that when accusations come against us, Lord, they fall to the ground. Lord, when, when, uh, when um, the enemy's plot, Lord, it is uh, given, Lord, we have eyes to see it, to take authority over it, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that we recognize the enemy, and we, we thank you for the power against the enemy. And most of all, Lord, we just thank you, Lord Jesus, for the grace that's being poured upon us this week, Lord, that by your grace we have all that we need to do your work. We thank you, Lord, for the spirit of self-discipline, which is ours through Christ. We thank you that you cause us to look and live more and more like you, the servant of all. We give you thanks. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Oh, okay. Seriously, just raise your hand. Amen. Everybody, come on up. Yeah. <laughs>